All rise. Court of Appeals, Division One is now in session. Please be seated. We're here in our case 1CACV 18-0537 Valdez versus, versus Delgado. Each side will have 20 minutes to present your uh, argument. Appellate, you may reserve any portion of that time for re re rebuttal, but you'll have to keep track of that time yourself by way of a clock at the podium for that purpose. We are recording the uh, argument both audio and v v v visually, so when you come forward, please identify uh, your client and yourself so that we can keep uh, all that straight. In a couple of days, the the argument will be on uh, YouTube if anyone wants to watch it. We have reviewed the record and the briefs, and we've conferenced the case, so we're familiar with the facts and the law. So when you uh, come up to argue, just start off with what you w w want us to hear and what you want to talk about. Counsel, you may begin. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, uh, I'm Douglas Allsworth for the appellant. Um, appellant uh, Randy Delgado is in the courtroom today. Uh, he appeals from the trial court's denial of his Rule 50 motion and also from the subsequent judgment quieting title to a certain real property in Phoenix, uh, the West Atlanta property. Um, we have raised two issues on appeal. The primary issue is uh, the court erred in applying the statute of frauds. Uh, the court reviews that issue de novo. Uh, the, the secondary issue is um, that the court erred in granting quiet title relief and disregarding the, the defendant's uh, arguments regarding sp specific performance as an equitable re remedy. Um, our primary argument is statute of frauds and my prepared remarks are addressed to that, but I would of course entertain any questions you have on either topic. Counsel, a procedural question, just to make sure I understand correctly, the, the Rule 50, the motion for judgment as a matter of law, am I correct in understanding that that came about uh, about a month after the jury's verdict? We, we, we uh, made a Rule 50 motion on the record during trial, uh, prior to the close of evidence. Uh, we uh, renewed the motion after uh, trial pursuant to Rule 50. Okay. We had also moved for summary judgment prior to the trial and raised uh, the issues uh, uh, regarding statute of frauds, specifically that it was an issue of law for the court and that the court had to find the unequivocally, unequivocally referable standard having been met. The oral motion during the trial was relatively sparse, but it was renewed uh, uh, post-trial um, you know, and, and fleshed out in more detail. Isn't it a, a mixed question of fact and law because the government to look at certain facts? Well, uh, yes and no. The, it, it is not, it is a, it is reviewed, uh, the issue of whether part performance takes the contract out of the statute of frauds is reviewed de novo. And the court is not reviewing whether there was sufficient evidence presented to the trial, uh, presented to the jury to sustain their findings. The court is actually reviewing whether plaintiffs should be excused from not complying with the statute of frauds. The statute of frauds is a clear legislative prohibition uh, uh, against the enforcement of an oral contract to convey real property. So is that a preliminary determination for the court to make before it, it, it goes to the jury? I'm just trying to figure out how, how you're proposing we look at it. I, I, I believe that is the case. I think that is what the court said, uh, the Supreme Court said in uh, Owens v. Emmy Shep, 
and it's certainly what the uh, what Division II uh, decided in uh, Roe v. Austin uh, last fall uh, that this is an issue for the trial court. It is not an it is not a factual issue for the jury. It is an evidentiary issue for the trial court, and the trial court, as gatekeeper in, in essence, must determine whether the evidentiary threshold required by the statute of frauds is met. So is, do you see any continuing, is there any role for the jury in the question? Only, you know. But let's break it down. What's the role, if you're going you know, to give me a job description or post on some looking for somebody, what is the role of the jury and what is the role of the court? The, ju the, the role of the jury is to decide the underlying claims, the, um, the breach of contract claim. You know, with, with regard to part performance, right, that, 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 that's what we're talking about. Only about this exception to the statute of frauds rule. Uh, it's been raised in a lawsuit, and now what is the role of the jury, and what is the role of the court? The courts, it's, it's an issue of law for the court to decide. Uh, that It would typically be, be decided on summary judgment. And in mo Does it make that determination based upon the facts of a case? Yes. Okay, so who, who decides the facts? The, 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 the judge in deciding whether there is, ev the judge must decide whether the evidence presented um, is sufficient to satisfy the statute of fraud, specifically that evidentiary threshold that the um, evidence of part performance um, is unequivocally referable to the alleged contract. So um, would it be fair to say then that the, the jury decides the facts, a basket of facts, and then they give the basket of facts to the judge and he picks through it looking at the findings and he goes, either this is or this isn't kosher or, 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 or meet whatever standard of, of part performance exception. No, I, 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 think, I think the case law makes clear that it is not an issue for the jury, that it is an issue for the, for the judge, either on summary judgment or you know, uh, pro before the issue goes to the jury. Now, in theory, a judge could present that, the fact question to a, to a jury and ask for factual findings, uh, but the trial judge would not be bound by those findings, nor would this court on review. So is this like... Uh Preliminary question under 104B, I, I think it is. I, I would. I th of evidence. It is an it, it is an evidentiary ruling. It is a complicated evidentiary ruling, but it is an evidentiary ruling, like foundation, like relevance, like other. But and and, and in fact, in the Shep case, Owens v. Emmy Shep, the the Supreme Court characterized it as one of relevance. So if the if the trial judge would find that the the statute of frauds was met, then what? Uh, then that would be an appealable issue. Oh, I mean, the, the exception was met or the... Yeah. If, if the trial judge found that there was evidence of part performance sufficient to take the, the issue to the jury, then the jury would have the case. But that evidentiary ruling would be appealable if if the jury, you know, found in favor of the, the, the party advocating the oral contract. So the judge is just making a threshold, <laughs> a threshold determination. He's not making any ultimate uh, finding. Correct. So, and I understand what you're saying, but <laughs> what I'm not clear on is it seems to me that facts matter in the partial performance assessment. This isn't some pure uh, or white wall lab environment in which we're interpreting a statute. We have facts. And what I think you're saying is that the judge, maybe on a summary judgment, needs to look at the statement and the counter uh, statement and, and say, uh, you know what, I do believe that he paid 8000 Okay? Let me write that down. He 8000 I don't believe this, and then, based upon that, uh, decide as a threshold issue uh, in a Rule 56 motion whether or not uh, part performance uh, is, is, is viable. Is that what you're, what you're arguing? Uh, yes, yes, essentially. I, I, the, 
but what the what the court is doing in, in evaluating the the, 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 the the referable standard, the unequivocally referable standard, it is it is following the case law that says that the part performance must be more than consistent with the alleged oral contract. The part performance must be inconsistent with um, other explanations and unintelligible or at least extraordinary except as an incident to ownership. That's the standard that the court applies. That this is not an issue of a plaintiff simply checking the box on uh, with oral testimony, potentially unverifiable oral testimony, um, and saying these are disputed facts. Let it let the jury decide the issue. The court, um, as, as a court of law, uh, must assess the reliability of that evidence. Well, uh, we, that, that raises an interesting uh, uh, question for me: is what is the trial judge actually finding? Is the trial judge finding the fact, or is it determining there is? enough evidence from which a jury could decide that, that factual issue. I think the court is deciding that either the, the plaintiff has or has not presented evidence of part performing that is unequivocally referable to the contract, that can't be explained absent the alleged contract. So they're, they're making the the factual determination are not the, uh, in your view. They're not determining a rational jury could find this. They're making a they're making a legal determination that the statute of frauds doesn't apply. That that's inconsistent with my understanding of how preliminary questions of evidence work. The the judge doesn't make a finding that that this fact is true or not true. It determines, yes, there is evidence from which a jury could conclude this, so, so, so we're going to let the other evidence in. Uh, I, I think if, if any plaintiff could simply allege facts that check the box boxes for part performance, then uh, uh, the exceptions to the statute of frauds would not be rare. Well, they but, would be more common. Well, uh, but you always have credibility issues. So, 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 you know, I know that you're saying this, but no rational jury could, uh, uh, could agree with you. Isn't that, isn't that doing a, a gatekeeping function? I, I think I think the court has that gatekeeping function to apply that legal standard. I think that that legal standard is not a standard for the jury. You know, the, the, the standard of whether the part performance is inconsistent with other explanations. In this case, for example, you know, the plaintiff uh, claims that he made substantial improvements to the property. Well, he also made substantial improvements to 10 to 12 other rental properties owned by Mr. Delgado. This was a regular course of dealings between the parties. Mr. Uh, uh, and this, this was undisputed. Mr. Valdez admitted during the first day of trial. There's another narrative. There are two narratives. Right, right. So, and, and I mean, I would agree with you that if that was the only narrative, we're talking Rule 56 territory. Um, saying that this is, in every instance, uh, a question for the court, uh, when it's tethered uh, necessarily to facts, uh, it, it just it seems uh, there, there's something that, that, that doesn't fit uh, 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 right. And I, I know you, you sort of went to an evidentiary issue, like a motion in limine, or they should, but that's not your argument. Your argument is the jury shouldn't make this decision. When there are two narratives, by definition, the unequivocally referable standard cannot be met. That is our position. Well, And I think that is the position of the Roe v. Austin Court in Division II, and I think that was the position of the Emmy, of the Owens, of the Supreme Court in, in Owens v. Emmy Shep. But the jury felt otherwise. They did. The jury, but the j jurors are motivated by passion at times and by a, a perception of victim. You know, in essence... Well, 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 we presume the jury 
fo uh, follows the law and, and the instructions. Yeah. And if, if, and I, I'm stating this conditionally, if the law is, as I posit, that it's a threshold determination for the, the trial court to make, to see, you know, could a rational jury make this finding? Did it, if that was a law, did the trial court still err here? If, 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 I'm not sure I understand your question. I mean, if the judge's role is to determine whether there was, whether a rational jury could find the part, uh, 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 performance, if that's the law, did the trial court still err in, in, how, in how it ruled here? I mean, yes. I, 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 again, I don't, I don't think the law is, is uh, I, I don't think the evidence presented at trial can uh, reasonably be, be, be construed to, um, to meet that the high evidentiary threshold of unequivocally referable to the alleged agreement. I think the evidence is just not there. That's a second argument, right? I mean, you shouldn't have gotten that far as your first argument. I mean, and then, but it did, and and so then we're talking whether or not there was enough there for a, a reasonable jury. To Judge Ho asked if if this were the law, is you know, was there error? And I said yes. And so I think that was that was the intent of my remarks was that but I I what I our primary argument on Rule 50 is that it's a matter of law, and I think that's what the Roe v. Austin court said, and that. You know, the threshold for overcoming the statute of frauds should be high. Um, uh, uh, the statute reflects concerns regarding the re reliability uh, uh, of oral evidence. Um, it's not, it's you, not should be high. It is high. It is high. It is right, high. Right. I mean, the and, jury found it was met, but it's very high. That, that's a pretty high standard. That partial performance, uh, you know, explainable in any other way. Uh, I, I agree with you, um, but my only beef is whether or not uh, we're, we're saying that juries have no role in that. I think that I think it, it, it is a, it is a question of law for the court. I think that is clear. Therefore, the trial court was not bound by the jury's findings. Therefore, this court is not bound by the jury's findings. You know, this trial took place 19 years ago, or 19 years after the alleged events underlying the case. 19 years is a long time. Mr. Delgado um, could not remember details uh, that might have better explained his his actions at the time, made them more relatable. Um, his confidence in the details that he could remember was weak. Um, but Mr. Delgado had the statute of frauds. He had a deed to the property vesting title in him. He had a lease agreement signed by Mr. Valdez. The, 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 Mr. Val, the plaintiffs did not even dispute that that was his signature on the document. And you can compare the document to the um, uh, to the uh, retirement uh, release that uh, Mr. Valdez signed contemporaneously. It's nearly identical. Mr. Valdez signed a lease to the property. Mr. Val, Mr. Delgado had a deed to the property. He had contemporaneous evidence showing that he paid Mr. Valdez to do the work. He had contemporaneous evidence to say that he paid for the repairs to the property, and he had contemporaneous um, uh, evidence that he paid the full purchase price. Now, Mr. Valdez was essentially accusing Mr. V Mr. Delgado of fraud. He was essentially saying that Mr. Delgado tricked him into paying a down payment. He deceived him into improving the property. He. Um, uh, falsely promised that he would convey title after 15 years, and he uh, cheated on his taxes for the entire time. That's the essence of the claim. But Mr. Valdez did not assert a claim for fraud. He could have, but he didn't. Um, he asserted a claim for breach of an oral contract. And uh, with a toothless statute of frauds, um, why plead a claim for, that requires proof by clear and convincing evidence? Uh, that, that uh, just just tell the judge that there are issues of fact that are disputed and ask for a jury to decide. I, I just don't think that's the law. I don't think that is what the, 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 the clear case law says is the, the, the role of the court in, in being a gatekeeper on statute of frauds issues. And I would res reserve my remaining time for rebuttal. 
Thank you, counsel. Counsel? Uh, Christopher Hill for the Appley, uh, Mr. Theodore Valdez, who's president and co-counsel, Jimmy Brenda, who's the trial counsel. Um, there's some, certainly some, some points I want to make uh, regarding the comments uh, from uh, Mr. Delgado, but uh, initially I just want to set the framework of what this, this case was. It was uh, Mr. Valdez, who I'm going to refer to as Ted, and Mr. Delgado, who I'll refer to as Randy, because that's how they knew each other. That's how they corresponded. They were good friends for many years. Uh, they um, had an agreement to purchase a home. Um, and they were made good friends, you know, prior to that time and subsequent to that. It wasn't any animosity that was going on. They uh, talked about it. They dealt with all their transactions with handshakes and cash. It wasn't a formal relationship uh, like uh, we might enter as, as legal minds. Um, they entered it in good faith, and I think they, uh, at least Ted thought. Counsel, d does, does a jury have any role in the Partial performance exception analysis or application? I think they have the, the, the complete role. And I think even in the, the cases that, that counsel was referring to, Owens, I think on a motion for summary judgment, I think my reading of the case and, and even the, uh, the Roe case involved undisputed factual issues, actions that neither party disputed took, that took place. And the court's role was to look at those actions and determine whether they were uniquely referable just to the, the contract, uh, this, the, the alleged contract. And what, what, when does that rule manifest itself? At what point does the court say, okay, I have what I need in front of me and I make this decision? Well, I think in this case it never did manifest itself. Um, I think in the motion for summary judgment, my reading of the record was that the, the court determined didn't look at the um, whether the actions were uniquely referable or not because the actions were disputed and it was going to be a jury determination. I think that was the initial uh, threshold was that we have factual disputes. That, ha that, that has to go to the jury for the determination. I think once it went to the jury from the jury instructions that I read and, and the court record that both parties were comfortable with the jury making the determination whether the actions that took place uh, as the jury determined were um, elements or were uniquely referable or were uh, composed part performance. So you're saying it's no different than any other summary judgment? Issue. In this case, no. And I didn't well, see no, any... No, you're saying partial performance as an issue is no different than any... The only way the court is going to, uh, to resolve that issue uh, in this case would be if one of the narratives was missing. I think certainly in this case, and the, the authority that I reviewed, uh, there wasn't any, uh, I don't think there's been any determination that the court would initially, initially look at uh, two narratives and, and pick one out or determine whether one is more true than the other or look at both of them and say neither one meets that threshold. I, I don't think that's practical and I don't think that would be ever be the role of the court to determine what narrative is true if, if there were two. Is there an argument that um Yes, uh, the decision as to whether or not uh, something is partial performance uh, or not is a question of law, but that question of law is captured and described in a jury instruction that is provided to a jury that hears the facts and they bring back like their instruction booklet and then they're looking at what the judge is saying on a question of law. He's describing what the law is. Is that maybe what uh, these cases like the Division II case, when they say that this is a question of law, mean? I think it's certainly they're just looking at, uh, it, probably like any motion for summary judgment, if you have no disputed factual issue. Uh, so take that off the table. Um, given these facts, uh, you know, in terms of part performance, we look at what the actions are and, and see if that is uniquely referable to the contract. That's simply all they're doing. I would concede that's a legal determination. Um, at least it has been. In this case, it was not. Um, Mr. Randy uh, was comfortable letting the jury determine that, that question, at least 
uh, from my reading in the record, they submitted the jury, he participated in the jury instruction, um, they formed the jury instruction that they were going to let the jury make the determination whether the factual record that the jury found was sufficient to meet, and I think the jury instruction was specific enough on what... Well, what was he supposed to do? He moved for summary judgment. Or should he just say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to provide a, a counter or... Well, I think his summary judgment addressed disputed factual issues. Um, and I think that's what the ruling was. It wasn't on saying this is a legal question before we get to the trial, decide as a matter of law whether or not there's partial performance. I think that was the substance of his motion. Um, at least that's how the, the judge looked at it. I don't think the judge addressed that part of it. Uh, that so you can you want us to find there was a waiver where he files that motion, uh, yet doesn't, uh, and files a Rule 50 uh, uh, before the verdict. Uh, and just doesn't say something in connection with the I would like for you to find that. And if you don't, I don't think it's dispositive of our position and the merits of the jury verdict. Um, because the jury went on, and if we, we, we looked at, well, we have these factual issues, we, we have these basket of facts that, that um, you made reference to. I think the jury had to determine those. And if the jury determined those, which I think they did, explicitly and implicitly, um, the only way that the jury or a judge or any reasonable person can look at that is that those only can refer to a contract for sale and not a rental agreement. So, you know, I discussed in my brief the fundamental error. I think if you get to that portion of it, um, nobody's going to look at the facts any differently. So he, whether he preserved it or not, the Rule 50 was, was uh, I think, didn't have any merit. Um, and so if he wanted to preserve that, you know, he did. but. Um, I don't think it, it, it makes much difference. So, the statement that the courts have made that the text of fraud is a question of law, you, you're arguing that's a correct statement under those cases because the facts are not disputed, but if they're not, if, but if they are disputed, it's not a question of law, it's a question of fact. I think certainly yes. I, I think uh, if you have any disputed factual issue, I, at least in our court system, our legal system, you just have a, a right to a trial by jury, and, and the jury would determine those underlying factual issues. And at, then at least then you would have a, a factual basis for, if it did go for the judge, I, I guess the judge can make that determination on a legal basis. But I don't know that you would. If you went to the jury, I think you referenced that, you went to the jury with all the facts, and you went to, why not go to the jury with, whether and you instructed them incorrectly on specific on, on um, part performance, um, you can let the jury make the determination. But even if you get past all that and you say, well, maybe maybe it really was the, the judge's final call. He, maybe this was just an advisory, not the facts that the jury found the facts, but, and the jury said, yeah, it's part performance and it's a contract for sale. Even if that was advisory, well, then take it back to the judge, and and the judge is going to find the same thing. Under these, this, these facts, I don't think any judge is going, is going to say, well, I, let's see, this is, it could go either way. I don't think that's the case. I just don't think we have any facts that are in um, Randy's favor that would suggest that this is a rental agreement. Um, is that what you're asking us to do? You, th you think that's, that's what we're, 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 we need to do here is see if there's any facts on his side of the scale and if there are reverse? No. I don't think there are any facts. I think the record speaks for that, and and he, he missed a lot of them. There's a lot of facts that there never been was were never addressed in our brief, and that's that, that in his briefing. I'm sorry, he never addressed that was addressed in our briefing. The whole beside before you even get to the the down payment, you have the whole transaction um, of how the the house was located. Uh, Ted was the one that located the house. Uh, Ted negotiated the purchase price. Uh, Ted did the initial inspection with the seller. Randy was never part of that. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think as a, a jury, just not as a lay person, you look at those incidents and you say, that's not someone that, that's buying the house for their own account. Um, they're not involved in, in the initial negotiation or inspection of the house. Um, you have the, um, which it wasn't brought out. A lease agreement, right? There was, well, I, don't, I don't think it was an agreement. There was a document that they produced at trial that was uh, titled monthly rental agreement. Was it signed? It was, uh, that document had a signature that matched uh, Ted's. 
that was addressed at trial. Ted testified that he doesn't have any recollection of signing it. In fact, he, I think his account was that Randy brought documents over to the house one time. Ted didn't review them. Randy just instructed him to execute them. So that might be one of the documents that was included. We're not, as an appellate court, we're not in the business of looking at the facts except to determine whether the trial court was within its authority to decide whatever it decided. I would agree, but that's what Randy's asking you to do. In his briefing, he's asked you to look at the facts or the testimony, the evidence, and saying, you know, that's not credible. You can't believe their story. They need something more than what they brought to the table. They need some sort of documentary evidence to support their part performance, which I think, you know, turns the whole thing around. If the parties didn't have the wherewithal, the understanding, the tenacity to document their written agreement or their agreement in writing for the purchase of the house, they're certainly not going to take the time or make the effort or have the understanding to document their part performance. So to require that there's some documentation that Ted made a down payment, yeah, I think you and I would say, well, why wouldn't he do that? That seems obvious, but they didn't. It was all handshakes and cash. And throughout this, there was no documentation of making repairs, of making payments. It was all just conversations and cash transactions or offsets. I think that's what was in front of the jury. That's what the jury found in favor of Ted. I'm not asking you to look at it differently, but certainly Randy's asking, I think, the trial court and this court to undermine what the jury found and said, you need something more. For part performance, you need documentary proof, which I didn't find any authority to that effect whatsoever. So, no, I don't think we're asking you to reweigh the facts at all. We're just asking you to certainly look at the facts that were there and saying, you know, the jury made, there was certainly enough evidence to support the jury's verdict on the underlying factual issues and to the extent that they made the determination on the part performance. Some of the other facts, you know, of course they were disputed. I think, and I think Randy indicates, or at least he wouldn't dispute that if there was the down payment, if that $8,000 down payment was made, that certainly would support part performance. That was a factual issue. He disputed it. And that's what, I guess, you know, cases are all about. And that's why we have jobs is because parties don't agree on the facts. That was, we presented evidence to that effect in the trial court. It was Ed's Ted's testimony. It was Lisa's testimony. Counsel, let me ask you, in William Henry Brophy College versus Tovar, at page 195, the error is, it says, and I quote, the sufficiency of any particular acts to constitute part performance is a question of law. What does that mean? So if the acts are conclusively established, or at least not disputed, if the acts to constitute part performance, that would be a question of law. I would not dispute that. Whether the acts occurred and what the acts are, I think, is a, certainly if it's disputed, you resolve that factual dispute with the jury determination. So again, I think that's consistent with Owens and the other cases where there were, nobody disputed that this was done. This money was paid, or I fixed up this house. Nobody disputed that. It was, okay, we look at this money paid and this house fixed up. Does that constitute part performance? So this isn't saying that at the end of every statute of frauds case in which the part performance doctrine has been raised, there is a final chapter in which the judge comes in and looks at the factual findings and says, yeah, I think there's enough. That's not what this is. That's not in the legal authority. Now, I'm not saying it couldn't exist, but this court or some other higher court hasn't specifically addressed that question, whether 
if you got this factual dispute, then you get the factual determination from the jury, and then it goes back to the judge. Um, would it be a fair characterization to see, say that that role for the judge exists? It just exists in the in the drafting and preparation and giving of jury instructions, which are the law for the case. Well, I don't know why you'd put in the jury instructions if you're not going to let the jury make that determination. If we're going to say, jury, you just go out and determine the facts, but don't find any part performance because that's my role. I don't know if there's any reason why you'd instruct the jury to that effect. Yeah, I wasn't um, clear with my question. Is it always the case that the jury instructions represent the law of the case? Or are you saying that the jury instructions are the Well, I don't factual? know if you'd need to instruct the jury on part performance if they're not going to make that determination. In this case, you could instruct, if the, if the judge was going to make the final ruling on part performance, you can say, jury, uh, find whether there's the $8,000 down payment. Jury, find whether these repairs were compensated or uncompensated. Find that uh, Ted negotiated the purchase price. Find that Ted made 15 years of payments uninterrupted. And bring me those findings. Then you've got that basket of facts, and then the judge can take it back. That's what happens? I'm not saying that's what okay, happens. Okay, so neither that's am not I, what, to be clear, what I was saying is instead of that, the law is preliminarily provided to the jury. Uh, the, no, I say the law, no, it's not been addressed. The law doesn't play a role. Uh, the law. Where, where does the judge's role in the law come in then? Well, I, I guess after the jury's determination of the facts. But, but I don't think that's established in our case authority that that's what happens. Well, but in... You take a criminal case, for example. If someone is on trial for aggravated assault, the jury is instructed, these are the factual elements of aggravated assault. You determine whether those elements are factually met. And if they are, then the, the person is guilty. In this case, doesn't the jury need to be instructed that it needs to find poor performance and have that defined so it can determine factual, you know, whether those facts meet that standard or not? And that's what was done here. It was done here. It went through that trial process, yes. Uh, and I think, that's, okay. I think that's what Judge Perkins was uh, I'm sorry. Alternatively, then, if under under some of the rationale, you can say, well, we're still going to reserve this for the judge to determine whether these acts are part performance. It's never the jury's role. Unlike the criminal law, we're just going to say, well, did you commit these acts? And then the judge still has this discretion to say, well, this uniquely referable, this standard is only for the, the high legal minds. The jury can never comprehend that. Well. You know, I don't see that after a jury trial. I can maybe see it on a motion for summary judgment. But it, we have authority that says, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a question of law. So I don't know how you... Uh, um so it really isn't... Why would those cases say your argument necessarily is it's not a question of, of law that the judge instructs the jury on the law on the statute of fraud. And that if, the, if there's evidence from which the jury could find part performance by that high standard that's established in the law, then the jury decides that and not the judge. Is that your... Well, that's what was done here. And I think that's a fair, maybe a fair process. And that may be true, but that's not... It doesn't square with it being a question of law. I would agree. It doesn't square with the authority that we have that it's a question of law. Now, is it always a question of law? Well, maybe it's a question of law, on, on, at least at the motion for summary judgment, judgment well, stage. Th th this, se this sentence makes sense if you say, in that case, Brophy, uh, there were no questions <coughs> of fact, and we had a undisputed record. And so in that context, uh, under summary judgment, um, the pure application of, of, of illegal doctrine to uh, an undisputed set of facts uh, would qualify as a legal question. Uh, the, the larger issue is, does the jury have a role 
And in this case, I don't have the record of this case before me, presumably the jury didn't have a role because there weren't dueling narratives. That's what you seem to be distinguishing, using to distinguish. Well, certainly, yes. There was dueling narratives. There was trophy. And there was disputed factual issues that if you certainly found one way, and that's how the jury found, you know, I think there is no legal mind or otherwise that would say that we don't have part performance. And my last point would be, you know, we even get past part performance, and I brief that, because we have everything. We not just have a few steps in that direction. We have, you know, 15 years of payment. Ted did everything he was supposed to do. There was nothing left to be done. So I don't think we even get past that uniquely referable. We got everything that Ted was required to do. Thank you, counsel. Your time is up. Are there any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. The Austin case held very definitively whether acts are sufficient to constitute part performance so as to take the oral contract out of the statute of frauds is a question of law. I mean, they were quoting the Brophy decision. I don't know how to square that and say it's an issue of fact for the jury. I think if you look at the case law where this rule was developed, those cases typically do involve disputed facts. The Emmy Shepp decision in particular involved disputed facts, and the court held whoever is right on this, it is irrelevant. Well, counsel, so this really isn't a case where a jury has a role. It all depends on the court. There shouldn't have been a jury trial at all. Correct, Your Honor. And the decision for the court is relatively simple. I mean, it is, at least in theory. It is can the plaintiff's performance evidence be explained by something other than the alleged contract? If the answer is yes, then the statute of frauds bars the claim. And if the answer is no, then your client loses. We don't care about a jury. Then it goes to the jury. And if the court answers yes, or actually if the court answers no, to answer your question, and the plaintiff's performance evidence cannot be explained by something other than the contract, then the claim goes to the jury. The exception to the statute of frauds is met. That's the legal role. But the right to a jury trial is not a right to that decision, because the legislature has determined that contracts, oral contracts to convey real property are barred. Absolutely. So the court has to determine, as a matter of law, whether that legal bar applies or whether there is an exception recognized by case law. May it please the court, we would ask that the court vacate the judgment of the trial court and remand with instructions to enter judgment on appellant's quiet title claim, counterclaim. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, counsel. We appreciate your arguments today. We'll take this matter under advisement and we'll issue our decision in due course. Thank you. We stand adjourned.